Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so let's start our section. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vidru. I'm a PhD candidate from Monash University, Australia, the other side of the globe. And it's a great, great honor for me to chair this section today. And uh, to start with our first presenter today is Chua. And he, uh, he's from the Open Education Consortium. He's a web developer. And today he will share about the implicit and uh, analytics in online OER platform. So please welcome Chua. Thank you. Let's start. Right. So I think this community has some interesting challenges ahead. And like the fact that how we think about data privacy, openness, rights on the web is something that's like a, in, I'm not sure, like expression would be elephant in the room. But maybe it's not even an elephant. It feels like there's like a ghost of an elephant that we're not touching or not close to addressing. So, you know, the media and the popular notion is like we leave breadcrumbs on the internet everywhere. You know, you surf around, you get targeted by ads, super cookies, you know, su almost like super bugs. Everything you do, like you install the ad blocker, you get viruses through and so on. And, you know, you think, okay, this is open community, we care a lot about privacy and rights and openness, but I don't know, it doesn't feel like right. Because you look at the modern OER, you look at the modern OER sites, like it's just as bad as the rest of the web. You look at the big, you know, the massive online course platforms, they, they do the same stuff, they run the same analytics, and you know, then, you know, they even have idea and I'll come back to YouTube, is that, you know, they give you a free MOOC platform, but then you can pay them to get the data on your students. Um, so that means that they gather data. And it doesn't seem that anybody's outraged by that. You know, it's normal. Um, and then we talk about things like, ooh, YouTube, right? And, oh, come on. So, YouTube has amazing, you know, data gathering infrastructure and they, you know, provide related cat videos and they make sure that you click all the suggested stuff that makes you outrageous and you click more and all of that. At the same time, you know, I go to a presentation about H5P and everybody excited that now we can put annotations on top of YouTube videos that, you know, a random person uh, uploaded on the internet. And nobody seems to be outraged about the privacy policies, right? And I would understand, like, if the idea is here that uh, university uploads to their YouTube channels and they have a, an understanding of what's going on, but they don't. We just kind of re-upload re randomly, you know, almost pirated, well, it's not pirated because it's CC license, but videos on YouTube and embed it into our learning management system and so on. And I just wonder, you know, is that a good practice? Is that a good idea? Is anybody worried about this at all? Quick show of hands. Is anybody worried that a random person has YouTube analytics viewership data on OER video in your LMS platform? Anybody? One? Okay, that's good. Two? Yay! So, there's... That's a start. So... I'm worried about this. It's, it does not seem right. And that's one way. And there's also more like personal matter, which is like, I would love to have a copy of that data. Like if I'm embedding the video from MIT that, you know, from OCW MIT into my LMS, I would love to see what, you know, my students are doing or, you know, what users are doing, but I can't. And at the same time, you know, there's this kind of, I don't know, it's, it doesn't seem right. So. How do we get the data and how do we, you know, tell our, you know, users, students, faculty members that this data is being gathered? You know, are you going to have the same European experience? Like, hey, this is a video on YouTube, so Google gets the data, MIT, for example, gets the data, or whoever else, right? So, and what happens if the student doesn't want to click OK on everything? Are they just giving up on that? How do we design services that have privacy? 
that are privacy first in addition to open you know, content. So I don't see enough debate and you know, guidelines and solutions in here. And then, you know, things like, which is really weird, it's like, okay, so we have something like OpenStax. Of course they wouldn't use data gathering tools on their website. And I mean, granted, I didn't do like a huge analysis, but that's a lot of tracking for somebody that we as a community always say, this is the website that you should go to. And like, okay, is that the community standard? Is it okay? if I run Facebook retargeting trackers on my OER project. Does anybody mind? It doesn't seem so. Um, so yeah, that makes me worried and I'm wondering like, what's the problem? Is the education? Are we just tired of fighting too many battles? But we're, we're definitely look, losing the privacy and data gathering one. And I'm not even talking about the, you know, learning analytics, it's just like the marketing websites are full of tracking. Um, so at least when you know, th we were looking at GDPR, so the general data privacy regulation in Europe, you know, there are methodologies and things like privacy impact assessment tools that we could run. So um, one approach to that would be like create an OER privacy impact assessment framework where in addition to making sure that the content is you know, licensed correctly and has all the affordability of open educational content, we could also say, well, is it pri you know, does it respect the privacy of users, of students, of teachers enough? Um, so that was one way. Another one is obviously to say, well, we just provide our alternative hosting solutions. So yes, the video is on YouTube, but we will provide proxying solutions that will download the video from YouTube and host it on truly free and non-tracking platforms. And I, I think there's like opportunity for companies to kind of step in our community and start providing some of that. And you know, to decide like, are the tools and trade-offs worth it? So uh, in Barcelona at Open EdTech, everybody seemed to be really want to go, uh, you know, stop using things like Google Docs. But it, they were fine with YouTube, so. What do we want? Like, do we have any priorities as a community like, about the privacy of our tools? And I really feel there's like no, like still looking for the correct forum, discussion group where people would like be open to saying, yes, this is a problem and willing to, we are willing to invest into solutions. Um, so not just get opening up the content, but also keeping it uh, privacy aware. Thank you. So you have said that you want to get some discussion from the, like, uh, the audience. So do you have any problem or any question already in mind to raise? Yeah, I mean, is anybody like outraged or interested or has something to add to the debate? Oh, wow, there's one hand. Hey. So uh, look, I'm not outraged at YouTube because tracking clicks is literally YouTube's business model. So if you use YouTube, you're going to get that. Um, there are other places to put OER content, um, and there are safer places than that. Um, but I agree, we need to like make those bigger and better and more um, available. But then you do need to think about what is the alternative business model of that service. And I don't like it to be advertising, and you don't like it to be advertising, but, um, and there's no but, um, we need to find uh, the better models. And it means, you know, the collective wealth of society needs to be channeled in these ways. And so at some point, there's going to be governments, there's going to be communities, associations, like we need to uh, put our money towards the things we want to see. And uh, that's kind of the bigger thing in a way, like not creating the service or avoiding a service, but like what is the alternative and where is it going to sit and who controls it and who pays for it? Thank you. Yeah, so the sh what I heard is like there needs to be a shift from advertisement-supported uh, advertisement OER to alternative business, well, sustainable business models. Thank you.
do we have any other questions for, yes, please? Over there. Oh, over there, I'm sorry. So, oh, so please. Hi, you okay. After that, yes. Um, so, okay, you're speaking about H5P and the ability to now alter someone else's content, right? Um, but wouldn't the same thing apply to any content then that's on YouTube? So isn't H5P then the problem? No, the YouTube is the problem. The YouTube is the problem because, as Martin shared, it's like it's advertisement supported. So there's no way to effectively opt out of privacy track, you know, uh, of user tracking. Yes, so my question is, um, in order to don't be tracked, there is this tool in the internet called DuckGo. I don't know if you know it. Yeah, is, DuckGo. Is this an option to, to browse the website uh, and use OER without being tracked? Um, it solves the search engine tracking problem. It doesn't solve the, you know, you, like the video hosting problem because somebody still has to host the video. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, our next presentation is about media portal for STEM teaching brought to us by Corina Hatton, the, pro, uh, the project manager from STEM education at Siemens Stephen. So, Corina, the stage is yours. Thank you. I have to open the presentation. Oh. Hello, my name is uh, Corinna Hartung. Today I'd like to show you the Siemens Stiftung Media Portal as a best practice example for open educational resources. Siemens Stiftung is an independent foundation that is active in three areas, development cooperation, culture, and education. It was established 11 years ago. We are headquartered in Munich, Germany. Starting this year, we also have a regional office in Santiago de Chile. We are active in three focus regions. It's Africa, Latin America, and Germany. Our commitment is based on the 17 SDGs of the United Nations. High quality, freely accessible education is a basic requirement of development and prosperity. We focus our efforts on STEM education in primary and secondary schools. In our education program, Experimental, we train teachers in inquiry-based learning to make experimenting and problem-solving fun for students. In our digital media portal, teachers and students have fast and easy access to digital science and technology materials in three languages, English, Spanish, and German. All media on the media portal are free, openly accessible, and editable under CC by SA, wherever possible. The media portal currently contains over 4,000 media, including handouts for educators. On the media portal, you find images, interactive media, videos, audio files, and texts as Word and PDF files. You can download the media, and they are also available for live viewing. Siemens Stiftung fully supports the OER movement and its goals. Our target groups, especially in Latin America and Africa, need free and adaptable materials. When we started the media portal 10 years ago, it wasn't an OER portal because 
we received many materials only on condition that they be used exclusively for educational purposes. This means that for the first few years, users had to register on the portal and prove that they worked in the educational field. This clearly contradicts the idea of open educational resources. Starting in 2015, we added more and more OER to the portal and ultimately decided that the media portal should become a purely OER portal in the medium term. But as you can imagine, this was a very complex process that lasted several years. That's because we had to check the license of each medium on the portal for its suitability for use as OER. Updating the teaching methods was very time consuming because if one or more media were dropped from a teaching unit, the entire proposed teacher's guide had to be revised. Ultimately, of the roughly 6,000 media for the OER relaunch in 2018, only 3,500 genuine OER remained. Since then, the number of media has grown to over 4,000 because we are always working on new media. Um, we will provide detailed metadata for each medium. Users can easily copy the license text and paste it right into their adaptations. I think this is a convenient way to learn how to use the CC licensed media correctly. All media are screened by experts and meet strictly quality criteria. This is greatly appreciated in professional circles like universities, and the media portal is recommended and widely used. The, converse, the conversion to a pure OER portal that doesn't require registration was a huge success. Although the number of media fell by nearly half, the media access and the click rate rose significantly. And there's still a lot to do. As you know, the quality guarantee is critical to us. At present, our users cannot upload any media because the quality check would be too costly and time consuming. And we are facing another major challenge. While many media are available in three languages, and we are promoting the media portal in Africa and Latin America, the click rate in these regions is still very low. One reason might be, for example, in South Africa, Kenya and Nigeria, data volume and photocopies are quite expensive and therefore hardly affordable for local teachers and students. So it's not only free media needed, but also free access. Sure, there's still a way ahead of us, but with the transformation of our media portal to a pure OER portal, we made a big step into the right direction. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. This was a great and very uh, helpful work. So, uh, the audience, do you have any questions for Korea? Yes, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we uh, also, we as Polytechnic of Milan, we had uh, a lot of experiences uh, with open education in, in, uh, in African countries. 
And uh, in some situations, uh, they asked us to install servers with uh, uh, resources in the country in order to avoid the costs of the international exchange of data. Did you have uh, um, this experience or not, or uh, how you have uh, solved? Uh, no, we have uh, no experience. I think it's the next step to to um, to make research and uh, to ask what we can do better for better access for okay. Africa and Latin Thank America. Thank you. Thank you. So, any more questions for Karina, please? Okay. So. Uh, I have a question for you that uh, how do you convince the people to like share with you their work? I mean like like the people. Pardon? So you said that, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry for me, my English is so bad. <laughs> me neither. Sorry. It's not good. So how do you convince the people to create and share their OER with you? Um, do you provide trainings to the people? And uh, we produce them with partners. And, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. It's okay. not. It's not possible now to upload mm -hmm. on our portal. Right I now. see. I see. So mm -hmm. it's only you. I mean, your um, organization and other partners like mm -hmm. contributing. Okay, mm -hmm. I got it. Yeah, okay. that's great. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There's another question over there. Hi. Another one. Yes. Hi. Um, you showed some statistics about click rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you say one percent in Africa, um, like how do you get to one percent in Africa versus seventy-five percent in Europe? Where in Africa, how did you count that one percent? Is it the amount of students that you actually engaged with, and then you did research on that? Like I don't know. Where, where does that statistic come from? Uh, how, how how we know that is one per yeah. percent? Percent. Um, uh, I think it's. Um, Google, Google Analytics, uh, you, you can see where the people come from when they go on our page. Yes. Yeah, but that's kind, of, that's kind of misleading, don't you think? Because like, if you come to Africa and then there's one student out of 100 people who have access to a computer, but then, yeah, I'm, I'm troubled by that By the number? Maybe we can discuss it okay. <laughs> afterwards? Yeah, okay. no problem. Okay. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, one more question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, this is what? This is not a question. <laughs> this is not a question so much as a compliment. Um, thank you for doing that in English. I um, could you. see it was <laughs> tricky for you. I had um, pain. <laughs> I, thank you. Uh, I, and a tiny question uh, Is the software for the media portal uh, is it open source? Is it available for the software of it? No. No, oh. I'm sorry. It's not and would Siemens consider making it open source? It's a good idea, I'm saying. Think about it. Maybe okay. tell, tell people it's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. My, my name is V and I'm a PhD candidate. Today I will uh, present my research in progress paper about the necessary and sufficient condition for the development of institutional open educational resources initiative, the case of university in a developing country. So this is a part of an ongoing PhD project of mine, which is uh, trying to identify the factor of uh, uh, the factor influencing the development of uh, OER initiative in Vietnam. So uh, to start with, uh, I will share something with you about the context of the research. So Vietnam is the uh, developing country laid on the eastern mosque of the Southeast Asian Indochinese Peninsula with an area of more than 331 square kilometers and a population of 95 million of, uh, inhabitants in 2018. And Vietnam has uh, really like potentials in developing and using uh, OER. So we have 235 university and institute in 2017, and uh, there's more than uh, 176 million students. And however, the quality of education is not high. 
at all. So uh, there is research, research on this, and the results conclude that we are lacking in information resources. And we are also facing with the financial issue, that is, we don't have money to license and subscribe to the commercial resources. And uh, the cooperation in creating and sharing learning material would is uh, considered as an effective solution. And among the information resources sharing services option, OER is one of the most frequently suggested. And the, about the OER activities in Vietnam, in 2002, uh, in the year that MIT Open Course were uh, introduced, the Fulbright Economics Teaching Program in Vietnam developed their Open Courseware program. And in 2005, Vietnam Open Educational Resources, which is VOER, program was established. This is a national program from the government. And in 2016, the OER at University Roadshow program is held by the government and uh, universities, which is organized training and open licensing for librarians and lecturers across the country. Uh, and there, moreover, there are more, four more scientific conferences on OER, which is the latest one is held in the capital city of Vietnam last month. Yep, and despite the opportunities, the strong uh, need and the support and considerable potential in developing and using OER, not many students and educators use OER in their teaching and learning activities, and no institutional OER initiative developed in this country. Why? So the curiosity bring me, uh, uh, led me to try to seek the answer for these questions, and the research problem here is the lack of understanding and knowledge of the uh, prerequisites of the, for the development and adoption of uh, institutional OER initiative from stakeholders. So this is a, a review of the literature. So we figure out that uh, there, during the last decades, there, there's a lot of research have been conducted on this um, topic, but uh, the investigative phenomenon is about the adoption of OER from the user perspective, which is a psychological process that leads to uh, the decision of adoption and or non-adoption. So, uh, and the trend, the research trend is much focusing on the development of OER in university in generally, without paying sufficient attention to the social cultural challenges in a specific, uh, specific context, for example, like private university in a developing country, or public university in a developed country, so it's quite like different. And uh, to, uh, to be clear, I need to clarify the development in my word means a comprehensive developmental process which comprise the planning, acceptance, adoption, creation, management, and putting into practice of all your initiative under the higher education provi uh, provider viewpoints. And the phenomenon that investigated in my research is not only the behavior or action of a group of participants, but it is a collaborative work that involves many phases, stages, activities, uh, and resulting in the formul uh, formulation of the institutional OER initiative. And uh, to uh, conduct the uh, data collection, I use a qualitative approach. I, uh, so far, I have uh, collected 20 semi-structure interviews with open-ended questions. And uh, I use a combination of non-probability sampling techniques. And the interview is uh, six university managers, three institutional OER leaders, five library staff, four education educators, and two OER champions. OER champions is uh, the chain agent, the one who lead OER leader in the, in the country. And they are from 14 university and association in Vietnam. And I, uh, to analyze the data, I use a grand theory abroad. And so far, I have uh, analyzed seven, per, seven of 20 interviews. So this is the very, very initial findings of mine, and I am so excited to share it with you. So about the necessary and sufficient conditions, uh, the, that, the data revealed that there are six uh, main conditions. The first one is policy. The second one is information technology infrastructure, funding, human resources, cooperation of stakeholders, collaboration of university. And among these conditions, the policy and human resources are the critical conditions that needed. So I will, uh, let's talk about human resources. So there, there are five main groups of stakeholders that involve in the development of uh, institutional OER initiative in Vietnam. So first one is the policy maker. The second one is OER project implementers the user, 
the OER content creators, and the last one is the facilitators. There might be others, the third parties that involve, but they may be there outside the, the university, so it's not my uh, research focus. And uh, it's uh, surprisingly that, uh, based on the research, I, I found that the roles and infrastructure, library staff and librarian skill, together with their relationship with students and educators, make them become an ideal place to develop OER initiative in Vietnam. And all of the interviewees highlighted that institutional OER should be developed, managed, and distributed to users by university libraries. That is the Vietnamese setting, I mean the research settings. And however, the role of other stakeholders are interconnected and inseparable. And about the policies, so in Vietnam there is something, maybe it's different from your country, that uh, before the introduction of OER and open movement, the teaching and learning uh, activities is work in a closed environment that like they have a lot of barriers for the student for example they are lim limited by age location time economic status and the teaching mentors and curriculum as well they, is it developed under a closed model so that the student they don't have the right to modify or arrange what uh, the curriculum like they, they want or do to their needs or des decide and the scholars they also believe that the, their intellectual capacity is determined by copyright, not by the pop uh, popularity or accessibility of their products. So uh, by bringing OER or developing OER in Vietnam, we try to uh, introduce something really new and we try to change a lot. So however closed and open is not just about the technology in, in, in our like, context. It's, it's, it's more than technology, but it's also uh, access the content, copyright, and mindset, or even philosophy, a new from close to open. And to change from close to open, the effort and cooperation and time from stakeholder is like is significantly needed. And uh, I found that the university uh, rectorate board members, especially the rector foremost, that is really responsible for developing the policy. And there are three types of policy are most needed in, at this time, I mean the start of developing OER in Vietnam. The first one is OER development policy. The second one is ad adoption policy. And the last one is recognition and reward policy. Because without the last one, because the other stakeholder, they don't have incentive in participating in it. So it will not lead to anything. So uh, yes, I'm on time. Thank you very much. Okay, so you have any questions for me? Yes, please. Sorry, I don't mean to be asking all the questions. Come on, <laughs> the rest of you, can, some <laughs> questions. That's fascinating. Um, I find it really, uh, thank you again also for presenting in English and uh, obviously yes. you live in Australia, so it's, <laughs> you're more used to it. But. Uh, the fascinating that everyone agreed that the OER should be stored in university libraries. Yes. And yet, last couple of days, I've heard very little of the OER projects coming from libraries. Maybe I'm just going to the wrong sessions, but is that, so who in the room thinks that, that who agrees with that? OER should be stored in university libraries. Should they be the ones providing storage for OER? Hands up if you think yes or no. Okay, a couple. So that's quite interesting. Maybe, but might be interesting to explore that, right? Universally. Yeah, yeah but I, I mean, like, thank you for your your compliment and your comments. So I personally think that dif in different contexts, that maybe the role of the libraries is different. So maybe in developed countries, that every unit in the university they are cap capable to do that. But in in Vietnam. We because there are also cultural contexts like many things that make the libraries no, no nobody, nobody really like want want to do that and nobody really have the like the role and the motivation to do that like more than the but library. This, yes. I, I think that's something we can learn from Vietnam. Is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I think you it's a uh, you're talking about problems of YouTube and tracking and all these commercial systems. Well. Let's use the public universities and get them working together and make big infrastructure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any more? 
Okay, so thank you. So I would like to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. So uh, Jan Newman, are you here already? Oops. Yes. Uh, okay, so our next speaker is Jan Newman, am I correct? So he's the head of legal affairs and organization in the North Rhine-Westphalian Library Service Center in Germany. And he will share with us about all you need to know uh, about the OER world map in six minutes and 40 seconds. So you will have a lot of time for discussion anyway. Yep, Yes. please welcome. <laughs> yes, fantastic. Dear friends, dear colleagues, it's uh, great to be here at OEC Global. It's a fantastic event like the usual in the other conferences and I have many slides prepared and I have to speak very quickly to give you a, a short impression about um, what we are doing at the moment. Um, so. Uh, the story all started back in 2012 in Paris uh, at the OER World Congress, at the first OER World Congress. And there I saw Susan D'Antoni, a Canadian professor, presenting her vision of an OER world map which should be built to enlighten uh, the community, the growing community of OER. And, um, it happened that um, two years after, Hewlett uh, did uh, rise a call for the building of the OER world map and we applied and luckily uh, we achieved the uh, funding for building the OER world map. And that's actually how it looks today, um, six years after. Um, so we have um, close to 5,000 entries there. And as you can see, it's really an international uh, movement. We have um, data contributions from all countries um, in the world. The top um, countries are India, Brazil, um, the UK, the US for sure, and um, Germany. And um, so it, it really developed hugely uh, in, the, in the last years, but it's still far apart from being perfect or complete. Um, we did some works on our vision statement this year, and um, this is what we came up. I'm just going to read it to you. We strive for a world where humans connect, share, and collaborate across borders in order to foster democratic participation, social justice, and sustainable development. We believe that opening up education, its institutions, its practices, and its resources is necessary to make this happen. The OER world map contributes to this vision by facilitating the exchange of data, experiences and ideas between open educational actors and community. So it's a real huge uh, vision and it's also uh, a, an incredible huge scope of the project, which was quite a challenge for us. Um, some uh, features of the map, it's uh, multilingual, so you can add your um, data and, and stories in different languages. Um, it's all built on linked open data technology, so all these data is connected with each other and we are part of the linked open data cloud. Um, our um, data model um, is built on this principle as well, so you can link all entities together. We have actors like um, uh, organizations and persons. We have um, activities like policies, um, projects, services, and tools, and um, also events. And we also have narratives, so you can add stories to the map so that you can explain what is really happening because data doesn't give you enough information all the time. And on the right side, you can see how this looks on the map right now. This is my personal profile. And in, at the bottom part, you can see all the events I uh, attended to, all the likes I did on the OER world map, um, and um, other things. Um, so have a look at it, it's quite interesting. Um, we follow what we call a hybrid approach to data collection. When we started our project, we expected that all people would come and add and contribute their data voluntarily. And um, we found out that it's not happening like this. So even 
if uh, people are willing to share their data, it takes some time and all of us have uh, normally twice as much to do as they can handle. And so there's little time left at the end of the day to share your data. And so we, we said we need to support data collection and we have to hire people who um, do the collection and instruct it, trigger it, and um, edit the data. And the combination of both, of paid editors and volunteers, I think this is the way to proceed in the future. Um, this is one example from Germany. We received some German funding as well. And we have a central page for open educational resources in Germany. And the world map is part of this project. And as you can see here, we have the German map included in that page. And that's the way we, produce or we, we proceed, we want to proceed, because we don't believe everyone will come to a central page. And the information should go to the local pages where, where the community is already looking at. Um, this is another project which is going on at the moment, which is quite exciting. It's uh, from uh, Tel Amiel in Brazil. He started collecting data in Brazil. And actually, again, we um, gave him a small funding um, of 7,000 euro, um, or dollar, sorry. And um, he just recently noticed me that he thinks he has covered everything which is available in Brazil right now. And this is a very simple uh, calculation here, which is sure, surely not sound. But just to give you an impression, if, if 200 million people can be covered by $7,000, um, this would mean that um, 7 billion people, the world population, could be covered by $245,000. Um, and uh, I mean, that's money, but it's not really a lot if you think um, that it's really covering the world. So I, I think one of the outcomes is it's doable. We just have to decide to do it. And the community and governments have to decide if they want to spend this money into collecting the data. Um, we have a, um, a pretty powerful statistics tool in our um, platform. So everything which is go goes in there can be put in, visualized in statistics uh, on the fly in, in real time. And um, we, we believe that this is really a, a very strong feature at the moment, especially since um, we have just adopted the um, OER um, recommendation, and the recommendation also includes um, the obligation to uh, provide reports. So um, given the big picture, looking at the big picture, we think that the overall timing of the project was, uh, yeah, quite perfect, actually. It wasn't planned, but uh, just at the moment where the recommendation is there and the obligation to produce re reports is there, we have a platform which is really getting in a good, sound, uh, stable state. And, and we hope that this will give another push to um, collecting data. Um, nevertheless, I have to admit that um, working on this project during the last uh, six years was quite exhausting. And um, I, I sometimes feel like uh, Feidipidos. I'm not sure if you know this guy. This is the guy who uh, ran to, back to Athens after the Battle of um, Marathon and uh, shouted out uh, victory and then died. So I hope this won't happen. But it's, it's really a hard thing. And um, we think that now the time has come to look for a bigger organizational basis of the project. Um, so how can you participate? You can create a personal profile as soon as you have done so. You can add data and like data, light, set lighthouses and entries to show good examples. You can add your project and your services. You can become a country champion who takes care of data collection in your, con in your country. Um, you can host a topic. We are currently working on the OER policy registry to bring together and set up a list of policies which is really useful. Um, and you can provide us with new uh, cool uh, features and you can also tell your friends about the project. And late, last but not least, if you happen to have a cavalry at your hand uh, which is looking for new jobs, we would like if you would drop us a note. Many thanks. Thank you. What's a very thrilling project. It is. Yes. So, uh, our audience, do you have questions for Chan? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, 
Hi, Jan. Thank you. Um, that last slide that you had there now, you said if you have a, a what? A cavalry? A cavalry. A um, how would you want to use them? Um, yeah, it's a good question. What is the cavalry? So in, in our case, I think it's either um, major players like governments or institutions which have some resources which say, okay, we would like to um, help uh, building up um, comprehensive data sets like state initiatives, I think, uh, would be perfect examples. Also, I think there is a great hope for myself that um, maybe um, from AI there could come support um, that data collection can be supported and made easier.